from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy. Yes, there he is, Johnny on the Axe. What a way to celebrate your country's independence. <laughs> that, that is basically what... That's why you kicked us out, in order to have Johnny on the axe. That's America right there, yeah. In the opening, that's America, the opening (laughs) of Inside Jeopardy. Hello, welcome back to our little podcast, your exclusive and official destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Michael Davies, and joining me today, as always, is producer Sarah Foss. Still here, Michael, still here, thank goodness. Yeah, we are taping this, we should say, before uh, the July 4th holiday. Yes. uh, Before the UK elections, which are happening Weirdly, on July 4th. On July 4th. I guess they don't really need to celebrate that day, so they can do other things. (laughs) Yeah, I think probably everybody knows by now what a bad idea it was for uh, PM Rishi Sunak to call the election on July 4th, but also a slightly weird date to choose. You know, July 3rd is a very big day in my life, apart from it being my sister Rebecca's birthday. It's also uh, the traditional home of my annual last day of dependence party. I throw a big party on July 3rd (laughs) to celebrate the last day of dependence. We celebrate that glorious July 3rd in 1776, <laughs> where, where this land was still ours. And uh, 248 I throw that every year. years it's, ago. <laughs> yeah, it's my uh, very self deprecating tongue in cheek tribute to the what was once the British Empire. Will you be having that party this year, Michael? Uh, yeah, I'm a little late in planning it, but ah. I, uh, I, I, believe, <laughs> I believe as long as my kids arrive back from Sweden in time, I will be throwing it. All right. Well, it sounds like fun. If I if I'm ever on the East Coast, I'm not going to miss that party. That sounds yeah. Fun. Come to my Dependence Day party. Well, in your absence, Michael, we've talked a lot about the stamp. As you know, pre-sale underway oh. right now for the Alex Trebek commemorative stamp. I know you're going to be there for our event here on the Sony lot on July 22nd. But among the staff and crew, we're really we're really wanting our stamp to win if you can win stamps. So, you know, I checked back in with the USPS and they told me they just kind of estimate an interest and then they just they print, you know, one amount and they estimate it will take about a year to two years for it to sell out. Now, huh. just so we know what we're going up against, Charles Schultz sold out yep. in less than six months. Whoa. So that is the quickest commemorative stamp to ever sell out. So that's kind of what we're up against. Elvis also sold out. Uh, Mr. Rogers sold out in seven to eight months. So some big competition, but we've got Alex Trebek. Yeah, I think we've got a good, I think we've got a good shot. I mean, I got to tell you, this has given me great credibility at the Bridgehampton Post Office (laughs) uh, on the eastern end of Long Island, where, you know, I'm, I don't know that they, they have any particular animosity towards me, but I'm certainly not treated with a great deal of respect at the post office. <laughs> not However, the way you are I here feel, at I feel like, yes, I feel like now this stamp is giving me some real credibility in my post office. And I go to the post office a lot because we don't have mailbox service in Bridgehampton. So I have to go to the post office to go to my P.O. box and open it up. So we'll see. We'll see if this raises my standing. All right. Well, maybe you want to go to the post office. But if those of you who are yeah. listening just want to order up and pre-sale, it's usps.com forward slash stamps. You can get them in pre-sale. They will go on sale officially on July 22nd, what would have been Alex's 84th birthday. Oh, amazing. And can't wait for that event where we, you know, unveil the stamp. It's very official. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, looking forward to that. Well, Michael, for the first time in our pod's history, we're going to take a bit of a a hiatus. So also on July 22nd, the day of the event, that will be our last podcast because, of course, the show will go into six weeks of reruns where we're going to show off JIT and TOC. I know people want to see that again because that competition was so good. And then we're going to come back and premiere our podcast along with the premiere of season 41. That's all kicking off on September 9th. And Michael, we're going to have video highlights. We're going to show off these mugs from now on. Yeah, I mean, maybe not just video highlights. We might show the entire videos of the podcast at some point. That's what we're building towards, a video podcast of our actual show. Yeah, big dreams, big goals. And do we want to tease? Maybe there might be a special... Yeah, there may be. There probably will be. There almost certainly will be (laughs) a new co-host of the Inside Jeopardy podcast who will be uh, joining... I'm not quitting. 
No, no, um, just adding but, more, uh, more fun. But, but adding more, we, we might have a, a new guest on our podcast, so stay tuned for that. That's later this summer, but later in today's pod, Sarah will be joined by seven game champion Drew Basile to discuss his Jeopardy journey and how he will be preparing for his return for the TOC. Can't wait for that. And we ended last week with a three-game champ in Isaac Hirsch. Two of those wins were runaways. So we're going to get into the highlights of all of last week shortly. But first, let's take a look back at this week in Jeopardy! history. And finally, Tyler, you came in with 22000 What What'd you get? Who are Huey, Dewey, and Louie? That is correct. How much did you wager? $8,000. That takes you to $30,000, and you are a Jeopardy! champion. It was July 14th, 2021, when Tyler Vandenberg took the stage for the very first time oh. and prevailed as a Jeopardy! champion. Of course, this was also during George Stephanopoulos' run as guest host. George did so well. Tyler left us as a two-game champ, but of course he came back for Champions Wild Card. He made it all the way to the finals, ultimately defeated by another Jeopardy great, Young Shin Wong. And what's interesting about this time is that it really is when we kicked off this great streak of Jeopardy champions. So we had kind of had a lull that season. And then came Courtney Shaw. She won seven. Then Jen Jaswinski came in. Then Tim Moon. Tim then went up against Tyler. Tyler was brought down by Josh Sack, who then, of course, faced off against none other than Matt Amodio. It was a busy time. It was an exciting time in Jeopardy history. Wow. That was a lot of big Jeopardy names there, Sarah. <laughs> a lot of big Jeopardy names. That was names. a deep season 37 cut right there. Excellent. All right. Well, on Monday, after defeating seven-game champion Drew Basile, Kat Pisacano returned to go for her second win. Kat and Matt Brooks battled back and forth throughout the game, but it was Kat who took a small lead heading into final. Unfortunately, she was unable to come up with the correct response, and Matt secures a come-from-behind win. You know, in the post-game chat, Zoe shared that she was 11 years old when Ken went on his run, and yeah, at that age, too. she took the quiz that Ken created for Microsoft in Carta, and she got uh -huh. a 3 out of 10. <laughs> and then Ken joked, thank you for supporting me in my early 2000s in Carta work. <laughs> uh, on Tuesday, Matt returned, hoping for his second win. But challengers Chris Nichols and Kelly Prue put up a strong fight. Chris appeared to be in control during double jeopardy until he missed back-to-back -back daily doubles. That hurts, allowing Kelly to take the lead into final where she was correct to secure the win. You know, we always think the podcast is a good opportunity for a teaching moment. So sometimes mm. people get confused about what a true daily double is. So in this game, Matt found the daily double on the very first clue. He had zero dollars and he said, let's make it a true daily double. Ken then clarified, so 1,000, you want to bet the maximum because it's not actually a true daily double. That would have been zero or any amount that he had. So it's just a good opportunity here to point out. And then a little later in the week when we talk about the highlights for Friday, we're going to get into that even more. Yeah, as I'm still learning almost three years into this job, <laughs> uh, the team at Jeopardy take the nomenclature uh, very, very uh, seriously. You know, or nomenclature. I don't yeah. know how you pronounce that word. I in think the with States a British accent, you can say it however you want, Michael. It, it yes. sounds good when you say it. I did love Chris's interview. You know, he's a proud parent of six year old triplet daughters, and he likened them to velociraptors from Jurassic Park. They are smart, wow. but very destructive. And Ken said, Oh, are they here in the audience? And he said, Oh, God, no. Could you imagine? I've only, I, I, the only thing I'm aware of velociraptors is the way that they would hunt. And so I'm terrified of his triplets hunting down humans. That would be awful. <laughs> Dear old dad. Anyway. Yeah. Well, on Wednesday, Kelly returned hoping for a second win, but Isaac Hirsch had other plans. He went on a tear in double jeopardy, racking up 16 correct responses. And despite losing $4,000 on the final daily double, he secured a runaway win. Yeah. And even better, he is not the first member <laughs> of his of, of his of his line to compete on Jeopardy. His dad competed on Jeopardy in the 1980s, but lost, apparently. Isaac joked during the interview that he used to play him, I lost on Jeopardy. <laughs> I don't know that I'm allowed to sing that. Probably I can get away with I just that one I think it's okay line. here on the pod. And yeah. say, it's about you, dad. He <laughs> said that today we get to find out how real karma is. I don't know if I get sued on that one by the Greg Kin Band or I get sued mm, by Weird uh, Al. Weird Al. Yeah. Could be both of them. Tough to say. If you have a chance to go on and take a look at that image, Isaac's dad is a spitting image of a young Isaac. 
It's really, yeah, yeah. it's really, it's looks, really good. He looks amazing. I'm looking at the photo right now. Yeah, go find it. I think it's episode 289 if you want to go look that up on the J Archive, everybody. Well, That's let's hear great. how um, Isaac was feeling after becoming a Jeopardy champion, the first one of the family. What will your dad think about that, Isaac? There's a Jeopardy champ in the family. Uh, I, I hope he'd be proud. I, I assume he is <laughs> watching at home right now. Maybe he knew Mary, Queen of Scots. We won't. We won't ask him. <laughs> Either way, he should say he did, right? Oh, he will. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not like looking for you to get your comeuppance for making fun of him all these years, I hope. No, we, we've made him. I've made amends long ago. I, you know, we, we are on good terms now. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen his game or, or were you or just a I, twinkle I, in his eye when it aired? Or it, I was not born when it aired, right. but I did see it. Uh, my grandparents had the videotape of it and he got Final Jeopardy wrong because it was, at the time, it was the only actor to win Best Actor twice in a row. Tom Hanks did it later and the right answer Spencer was... Spencer Tracy, I want to say? Is Spencer right? Tracy, I think. That sounds right to me. I should remember that probably, but uh, <laughs> glad you were here. It would be very funny if you guys got the same Final Jeopardy 38 years apart. I would or, say Tom Hanks. I would not even yeah. risk it. <laughs> Today it's Tom Hanks. Yeah. Luckily we have a new one for you. Well, all three of you played well. Uh, you kept him honest. It was not a foregone conclusion until the very end, sadly, Bridal Veil Falls with the okay, S. Yep. You know, it turned out nobody knew Mary Queen of Scots, so it didn't mm. really matter. I'm, I'm glad it didn't hinge on your, on my very harsh ruling on the <laughs> S. <laughs> Isaac, is there now a family goal? Can you, are you trying to redeem your, your family honor after your dad's loss in the 80s? I won. I'll, everything after is gravy. I mean, I could... <laughs> Tomorrow could be a disaster, and it may well be, but I'm going to savor it for the moment. <laughs> That's a great attitude. I mean, nobody can, ever, nobody can ever take this away. You are now a Jeopardy! champion, two or three of you, and all three of you made it on the show, which is the hard part. Congratulations to all of you for being here today, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow, Isaac. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, on Thursday, Isaac returned and had to pull out all the stops to defeat challenger Josh Martin. They traded punches throughout the entire game. Isaac was building a strong lead in double jeopardy when Josh nearly doubled up on the last daily double to close the gap. A strong finish to the round gave Isaac the lead heading into final where both players were correct, giving Isaac whew, another well-deserved win. Well, this was the 4th of July show and so we had to do a little play everyone. on words, you know, with Ken's intro. So, of course, he said, Fourth of July, celebrating the signing of the Declaration of Independence by the founding fathers. And another father who might be celebrating is Steve Hirsch, the dad of our new champion, Isaac Hirsch. Yes, wonderful. July 4th will have a whole new meaning for the Hirsch family. I think so. During the break, Ken was actually joking with Isaac about the shirt he was wearing. And he said, I like it. Big thumbs up. Is that Burbank vintage? Because, of course, Isaac is from Burbank. And Isaac said, oh, yeah, it's from the 90s. And I have many more interesting fashion choices if I make it further. So another reason I want to see Isaac keep winning. What will he wear Absolutely. next? Another second chance candidate, too, Michael. We just keep oh, talking love, about them. You love the early identification of a second <laughs> chance candidate. I do. How many I'm people do we have in second hype. chance already this season? We've got like 400 people. Yeah, way more than we have room to feature. That's all I could yeah. say about it. But Josh Martin, 14 correct. You know, he had a $5,000 daily double. $14,400 double Jeopardy score correct in final. I don't know. We'll see. Ken caught up with the players after the game and applauded Josh on his big daily double wager. Take a listen. We had some real fireworks in that game. That was appropriate. I love the big wager on the daily double, Josh, I got to say. Yeah, I, I definitely felt like I had to do something there. Did you know it was Guam? Were you uh, pretty I was, confident? Yeah, I was pretty certain. I know that Midway is closer to the Hawaiian Islands, and so I felt pretty good about it. And geography is a good category, too, so... Is I that felt... common for pilots? <laughs> probably, probably. I mean, you'd Although like to I, think do so. know, I do know some that, that don't know the map very well. It's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me that. I fly too much. Well, you played very well. You both did. Uh, but against a very impressive champ, Isaac, another 28,000 today. How's it feeling? Surreal, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, this is going better than I could have expected, I would say. Uh, we just want to avoid geography as much as possible. I'm not good <laughs> oh, at it. Oh, I see. And yeah, if we get a geography final Jeopardy, things might go south very quickly. <laughs> south, but you wouldn't know. You're like, would, is yeah, that west? Would. Is that north? <laughs> they'd go some direction, so, yeah. Is that why you're not a pilot for that reason? <laughs> there are many reasons I'm not a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> there were some tough clues in that game. Like that whole, uh, we've never had that response before. You needed a lot of lateral thinking and inference. The Red Sea Scrolls, that also requires a little bit of, of inference, right? 
lateral thinking we got there it, it took almost the entire time but i figured out what rhymes with dead sea and went from there so you did get it for you knew if qumran was dead sea scrolls I, I, it was all like ring a bell it wasn't necessarily we wouldn't call it knowledge we'd call it like vibes? informed vibes vibes is a perfect <laughs> word for it yeah i everything i do is off vibes pretty much i mean it is kind of true you see words in a clue and for whatever reason you go down some line of thought and Maybe there's connections in your brain you weren't even aware of, I guess. But, yeah, uh, yeah. My, my quiz bowl captain in college called it the voice. You just listen to the voice, and the voice is sometimes horribly wrong, and you have a very bad guess, but you've got to listen to the voice no matter what. Where did you play quiz bowl? Uh, University of Maryland. Oh, that's a, they were a very good team when I was playing. I wasn't. I was, I was on the B team. <laughs> the B team? Yeah. Well, I mean, they were so good. The B team, like even the B team wins, look at this, $45,000 or whatever it is on Jeopardy. So congratulations. But all three of you played well in that game. It was a pleasure. I hope you had a good time. And uh, Isaac, you're back for game three tomorrow. Excellent. Good luck. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, we closed out the week with a dominant performance by Isaac. 33 correct responses, two correct daily doubles, and a double Jeopardy score of over $26,000. This earned him a no-doubt runaway win heading into the weekend. You know, just last week we were talking about how Drew Basile had set a new record of 33 correct responses, the highest we had seen all season, whether that be TOC, Masters, or JIT. And here comes Isaac. He's now tied with Drew for that season record. Yeah, wonderful player. And Alex gave us a perfect example. I said we would circle back to these teachable moments. Perfect example of a true daily double. He found the first daily double. He had $600. He said confidently, let's make it a true daily double for $600, please. Oh, you love it. And everybody on the producer's table gave a little golf clap yeah. at that point <laughs> for because he got it right. There Absolutely. you go. Wonderful. We also learned that Isaac's car was featured on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. And Isaac joked, I'm basically famous, um, that his car did so great. It looked the part. It looked beat up and old, which it is. And then in the post game, Ken had to ask Isaac, you know, now you've earned over $70,000. Will you be replacing the Brooklyn Nine-Nine car? And Isaac responded, I'm going to keep that car until it literally falls apart. But, you know... I work customer support, so $70,000 is life-changing money. And that's just so cool to hear for these contestants, that he comes on, and in a day's work, he's got $70,000 because of the knowledge that he has inside his brain. Yeah, fantastic stuff. Well, there you have it. Isaac is now a three-game Jeopardy! champion. Let's hear how he was feeling after the game. Congratulations. Thank I you. could see you two both buzzing in frantically, but uh, Isaac was kind of dialed in today. How's the signaling device been treating you? Seemingly very well. Uh, you know, finally years of just playing video games has amounted to something. <laughs> Do you think that's what it is? I think so. I, th I mean, I play a lot of video games, so it had to come in handy somehow. Victoria Gross and Masters were saying she played a lot of like rhythm-based games, like Rock Band or Dance Dance Revolution, like that kind of thing she thought was good for her. I was impressed with John Updike only on X Basketball Star. Like, is that what you got it off of? Yeah, Rabbit. The He's rabbit a basketball album? player. I know that. That's that's all, almost all I know. But I knew that. <laughs> is that Quiz Bowl stuff? Yeah, it came up before. I, I was a literature guy in Quiz Bowl, so I'm hunting the literature categories. And as we said, we're avoiding anything about geography or the world. I knew not to wager very much on this final Jeopardy because. I'm kind of clueless about the, the larger world. <laughs> well, you did have that daily double about the Russo-Japanese War. Yeah, but... And you were in a position where you didn't have to bet that much, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, I knew that he negotiated that, and I remembered that was a war. And, you know, again, vibes. All about vibes here. We're just sort of putting <laughs> things together and hoping for the best. Is that the, uh, the, like the millennial approach to Jeopardy, I guess? It's yeah, knowing stuff is overrated. Kind of knowing stuff is where it's at. <laughs> that's, what I, uh, that's what I've come to gather about America today. Thanks, all three of you, for being here today. It was a fun game. And Isaac, you're going to be back next week looking for win number four. And now, a quick word from our sponsor. Selling a little or a lot? Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point of sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Plus, they have the internet's best converting checkout, 
36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. What I love about Shopify is how simple they've made it to grow your business. You can manage inventory, track payments, and view real-time insights all in one place. Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash jeopardy, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash jeopardy now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash jeopardy. Now back to Inside Jeopardy. Okay, it's time for this week's host chat. An audience member asked Ken, what's your favorite movie? Favorite movie of all time. Somebody asked me this the other day and I said like, Back to the Future is kind of a perfect movie. Look how everybody just nods, like, yes. <laughs> like we're all in the cult of Back to the Future is a perfect movie. Yes. Um, sometimes I say Hard Day's Night, like the first Beatles movie, it really holds up. It's like super energetic and fun and they're very surprisingly funny, but it just depends on the day. You know, Alex got asked this question all the time as well, to where Alex's favorite movie almost felt like mine. It is uh, How Green Was My Valley, Alex's very favorite oh. movie, and it was probably the most asked question that people wanted to know year after year. So Ken is falling in line and Back to the Future, you know, it's a pretty good choice. I actually screened my favorite movie for uh, my kids the other night. As you know, one of my daughters is going to University of Edinburgh in the fall, which is where yes. I went to school. So I'm very excited. And so I'm, I'm having a lot of emotion about uh, my mother's home nation of Scotland right now, despite their terrible performance at Euro 2024. I know that you can't <laughs> stop thinking about that. I so, can't, can't um, get out of my and head. And my favorite film of all time, it's a Scottish film. It's Local Hero. Brilliant film to still, you know, I find so much in it every single time I watch it. And I've watched it so many uh, times it's about a, a Houston oil man who goes off to the, you know, the the west of Scotland uh, on behalf of his oil refinery to try and shut down and and buy an entire village, and he gets sort of stopped in his tracks by one old man who lives on the beach, old Ben who lives on the beach, and and won't 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 sell that beach to them. But it's just a great film. I really love it. And uh, I was watching it. And I was so excited. I mean, I was like 45 minutes in and really enjoying it. And I turned to all of my three children who were all fast asleep. They were all fast afraid, asleep. I was afraid They'd, this is where that story was yeah, going. Yeah, they, they had absolutely zero interest in my, in my favorite movie. Yeah. Well, they're really going to enjoy the July 3rd party, though, I bet. Yeah, they will. The last day of dependence. Very good. Well, I know you have to run, Michael. So we will see you back here next week on the pod. But now it's time to welcome seven-game champion and Survivor star, Drew Basile. Welcome. Oh, what's going on? It's great to be here. I mean, number one, it's <laughs> great to be a seven-game champ. So that that's that's most of it. But I'm also <laughs> happy to recap, you know, relive my days of glory and, you know, sadly, one day of defeat. Yeah, I see you're wearing a Jeopardy shirt. I am. I think this is back from, like, the 90s. You guys sponsored an Olympics in maybe 92, yeah, 94. that's, like, retro. I know. I went on Depop. I had to, I had to get some merchandise for the, the watch parties in Philadelphia and Detroit, you know, so I uh, did, some, did some trawling. Yeah, we have to know, because we saw that you did have one in Michigan and also one in Philadelphia. What's the Philadelphia connection for the watch party? Absolutely. So I went to uh, college at the University of Pennsylvania, but uh, you know, close right. to my heart, my girlfriend lives down here. So obviously, I got to come see her and celebrate with her. She brought everyone she knew for the Philadelphia watch party. And then the Detroit one was more my uh, my crowd. All right. So who parties better at a watch party? Is it Philly? Is it Michigan? Well, who does it oh, better? But, uh, you know, it's very different because it's like in Philly, it's all my college friends. You know, it's young people. You know, we went to this bar. In Michigan, it's like my my family, my grandparents. Ah. You know, it's, it's two different, <laughs> very different vibes. I got I had to wear the collared shirt for Michigan. Best behavior. Philly was, Philly was a little bit more fun. Plus, of course, I mean, that's my first game. That's a big game. Definitely one to celebrate. Yeah. Okay. Let's just go back for a minute because, yeah, it's a big game because it's the first time you become a Jeopardy champion, mm -hmm. but you're also up against someone who at this point, a lot of people had been tuning in to watch. Adriana going on quite a run. She's coming back to make it 16 wins and she comes up against, you've heard me say it once, our giant, <laughs> giant killer. Talk me through that day that game just tell me the story for sure uh now I, you know I, our listeners probably know this but when you're waiting to play jeopardy you're sitting in a green room you don't just arrive at the studio and instantly get on the stage but you get to watch the games so we're all sitting there we're very nervous i had a little bit of reality tv experience previously so i was <laughs> i was priding myself and be less nervous but still very nervous yeah and we watch adriana just dominate the first two games they're tight games she's composed she doesn't make mistakes and not only that, but we know that there's like 13 games of, of, of history where that she's done the same exact thing. So she's like a machine. 
So I, I'm feeling pretty grim. I'm getting up there on the stage with Tekla, who was great. One of my favorite uh, friends I made that day. But getting up to the stage, just thinking, all right, second would be good. You know, let's just let's just make myself proud. A good showing. Um, and the first categories come on and they're good for me. You know, there's some literature in there. There's some history. Those are those are my strong points. And I'm buzzing and I'm competitive and I'm realizing, oh, my God, maybe maybe she is beatable. I mean, it's going to be tough, but maybe she is beatable. And so that was kind of like a real pulling up of the morale uh, once the game started. And then comes that daily double moment. Absolutely. You know, I don't know. I'm sure you guys have some great episodes to come, but but a top a top <laughs> moment for the season, I like to think. Some real drama in it. I think so. Very Masters-esque, Drew. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I got I to gotta win Tournament of Champions first, but uh, we'll, we'll see someday down the road. No, but the daily double comes up. And at that point, it's been pretty back and forth. I think that she had the lead coming into uh, the, uh, Double Jeopardy pretty conclusively. And then I had battled back a little bit. And I just was standing there at the podium. And I was going to make a conservative bet. And I thought to myself, like, if I if I do this conservative bet, win or lose, it's still going to be a slog. It's going to be a battle. It's going to be back and forth. Who knows how it'll turn out? I mean, you know, she's got a lot more experience than I do. I just thought, why not decide it right here? Like, why not just lay the cards on the table? Let's just decide in one moment. I, I hate waiting. That's the thing about me. I don't like lines. I don't like having to, you know, <laughs> wait for the movie to come out. I just want to know. So I just figured, let's decide. And thank God it was a question that, uh, you know, I wasn't out to sea on. Um, yes. it, it was a naval question. And I think that once I composed myself enough to think through the answers, you know, just based on Pacific War battles, I was able to come up with something plausible. And it turned out to be right. And I think that, uh, I mean, there was game to go, of course, but that was pretty definitive. Yeah, that had to be such a relief because, you know, when you put it all on the line like mm -hmm. that, yes, you're willing to have it go either way. But wow, when it goes your way, that has to just feel incredible. It's like uh, going to the casino, you know, it, it's, a, it's a heck of a <laughs> rush. I mean, I, this is something I personally feel. We work for a lot of things in life and we work really hard to achieve them. There's so much anticipation that when you get it, it's just kind of like, you know, it's there and it, it's a relief. But when you get something out of the jaws of defeat, when it's luck, when it's a fluke, when it's really <laughs> on the line and it comes down to a single moment, it's just an inimitable rush. Um, and so I was blown away. And in a way that kind of worked to my detriment because like the game's not over. There's another daily double out there. You got to like pull yourself back together. And I can uh, sure. I can remember watching in Philly and the next one of the, the next questions was this mutiny of the bounty question. And that's like that's like something I know. And I was shocked on TV that I didn't I didn't even buzz in, you know, because like <laughs> that, that that's a no brainer. I think I was just so stunned that I was I was somewhere else. You know, I was sitting at the stands watching uh, after that big moment. Yeah, well, I referred to masters because it became so common. You know, all of our masters, they were doing true daily doubles, mm -hmm. betting five figures like it's nothing. But it rarely happens in syndication. So I just have to ask coming in. Did yeah. you know you'd be willing to make those Holtz Howerian <laughs> betting numbers? No, listen, I'm a, I'm a competitor. My str and I don't want to give away too much of the strategy because it's one I'll repeat. Ah, but yes. I, I, I want to kind of decide games, uh, win or lose, in, in the double jeopardy. That's when games are chosen for me. I want to try and run away with it if possible. And so those daily double calculations boil down to like, how much money do I need to decide it in double, right? Obviously in Masters, those guys are so good that there's no, I mean... There's no deciding until the very last moment, and it makes for awesome TV. And then you got to consider the fact, too, that it's not one and done. You know, they have another game and a game after that, right? So they can afford to take those huge, huge wagers. I couldn't. You know, it's it's do or die for me. But I think psychologically, perhaps, watching just, you know, that prowess of, of Holtzauer and Victoria and Yogesh on on, uh, on TV, maybe, maybe, maybe psychologically primed me to make a big move. And so, yeah, I was good. I watched. So when you look back at your seven game winning streak, is there a highlight? Does that moment stand out? Is it becoming a champion for the first time? I just would love to know when you look back at the whole mm. thing, what's the moment that you say, wow, that's, that's going to be my highlight. There's a couple real top moments. I mean, number one, winning that first game, elation. It was so, I was so pleased. Um, number two, it's got to be uh, the Jeff Probst shout out, which I mean, really touched my heart. I'll tell you, I had been a big fan of both those shows for a long, long time. And so to just so suddenly and uh, I, I, I it really, you know, bowled me over. I'm a softie. I'm a big, uh, big sentimentalist. So I, 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 you know, I had to kind of dab my eyes a little bit. That was a highlight. And then, of course, a big highlight would be becoming a five day champ. For me personally, I didn't have the highest expectations going in. You know, I'd played trivia in high school. It'd been a long time. I don't really do bar trivia. I'm not actually particularly good at bar trivia because all that pop culture stuff. I don't know that. But <laughs> I just figured let's go up. Let's let's maybe win a game and sort of have won more than a game. You know, that kind of those kind of felt like bonuses. 
But then you get to the fifth round and the fifth round, again, like in addition to the copious amounts of money, there is something to play for, which is like <laughs> tournament of champions. And I, you know, found out later. And as I was watching too, that a lot of people have kind of fallen short this season. You know, we've had a number of promising yeah. four, four time champions and three game winners. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't aware of that at the time, but I really did feel that mentality that like, oh my God, like, you know, here we are, like, it's all, you know, you've got something to prove again. Um, and so then that was really stressful. And to be able to come up on the final Jeopardy, um, which is not something I needed to do a ton. Um, that was, again, uh, extremely rewarding. So you mentioned that moment with Jeff Probst. I've said it here on the podcast. Our co-executive producer, Lisa Brofman, <laughs> big Survivor fan, <laughs> longtime friend of Jeff Probst. And she called him. She's the one that said, hey, <laughs> you got to know that Drew from season 45, he's doing great on Jeopardy. He's a five game champion. And he said, that's so cool. That's so awesome. I love that guy. So that was an authentic moment that happens because obviously we yeah. take multiple shows in a day that that call could be made. And then I could say, hey, Ken, make sure to tell Drew that like Jeff knows he's winning on Jeopardy. <laughs> oh, I mean, like Jeff probably doesn't think of me this way, but for years I watched Jeff <laughs> on TV, like the same way with Alex, you know, and now with Ken, you know, he's great. He's got a long future to go. But, you know, they're a part of your ritual. They're a part of your life in a non, in a, you know, tangible sense. I mean, getting to play on Survivor, obviously, it's like meeting your heroes. And I'll tell you, Jeff, even in real life, is a pretty statuesque guy. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's a force to behold. I felt that way about Ken. I mean, Ken has a real majesty out there, like on stage. He's so witty. He's so charming. So they say don't meet your heroes. Meet your heroes. I've had a great time. Um, <laughs> apply to Jeopardy. But the point is, is that uh, getting to hear from Jeff at a moment where, like, let's be honest, you need the support. I mean, people bring their loved ones for a reason. It's very stressful. It had my uh, heart beating twice, and I really appreciated it. Well, I mentioned Lisa because not only does she love Survivor, she was a big Drew fan. She oh. said she was rooting for you to win the whole season. She loved watching you on the show. Me too. I don't know what happened. I'm sorry, Lisa. You know, I got pretty close, but I really appreciate that. Honestly, it's such a blessing to meet, you know, to fans or to hear that I could I could make people's Wednesday nights just a little bit brighter. So which dream was longer in the making, being on Jeopardy or being on Survivor? Well, they were very different kinds of, of dreams. Because, <laughs> no, you don't say. Well, no, 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 but they were because I always thought of Survivor as this, this kind of test to see like how I've grown as a person. Because I, you know, I'm kind of a, an awkward guy and I've made steps to you know, be more outgoing and things like that. And that's how I thought of Survivor. And it was something I had grown up with. Jeopardy, I always knew I'm a smart guy. I was great at trivia in high school. Those skills would translate. Jeopardy was like business. You know what I mean? Like if I was going on Survivor and it's this kind of like vacation of soul, it's like a retreat. Jeopardy is, you know, we're here to make some money, etch my name in the history book. We're here to make tournament of champions. You know, that that was that was the rationale. Uh, you know, I came in in the suit. And then again, seeing Adriana there, I had to do some, some recalculation. I was like, <laughs> okay, maybe I'll, you know, settle for the consolation prize. But no, thank God, both dreams were able to come true. And I'm very grateful. They obviously are both very challenging. Mm -hmm. Describe the difference in terms of mental challenge between the two experiences. One of the things about Jeopardy is that, and as any as anyone who loses Jeopardy will tell you, there's there's no latency, right? You <laughs> have to come up with an answer in half a second. Like that's that's how much time you have to probably figure it out, prepare yourself to buzz by the time you've imbibed the clue. So it is immediate. Whereas Survivor mentally is actually a very different task because the, I mean the comp. The calculations are complex. There's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of unknowns in a way that for Jeopardy, maybe there are less. Um, and so the mental test on Survivor is, can I continue performing these long calculations with days of changing data when I'm in a mentally depleted state, right? When I don't have food. That's a different test. I will say, though, as you get to the end of that <laughs> five day taping at Jeopardy, I mean, the, the physical, right? uh, the physical <laughs> effects are non-trivial. Right. Like I'm a tall guy. My back is starting to hurt. My eyesight is terrible. I don't know. You can watch on TV. I'm like squinting every time I get a daily double. Uh, you know, I, I, even at the time I was like embarrassed. I can remember we were doing like the final Jeopardy thing. And somebody, someone in the crew kindly reminds uh -huh. me of my posture. And I'm yeah. like, oh, my goodness. We might have asked you to rewrite your wager a yeah. few times. You know, those zeros got a little wonky. Uh, no, no, I was, it's I was, hard work uh, up there. I was squirming for sure. It is hard work. And the physical side of Jeopardy, not to be discounted. Get up, practice standing for a while, you know, at home, buzz along, stand up. You got you to gotta prepare yourself for these things. And this is coming from a survivor survivor. I mean, you were out there for what, 28 days or something? Yeah, uh, 23. So uh, three days oh, shy of the sorry. end. <laughs> yeah, it was a while. It was a while. 
It's yeah. a lot. And this is what you're saying after two tape days. So I just I like yeah. that people are getting some perspective out there about just all that you have to bring mentally and physically to the Alex Trebek stage. Absolutely. It's a gauntlet. Well, we talk about the TOC. So now you're in. First off, how did you like your hero pose they put up on social? You know, <laughs> arms up, little Drew Basile. Welcome to the Tournament of Champions. Well, I liked it. And the thing about Jeopardy is that you guys are so, you're so classy, you know, in England, we might well, say, thanks. you know, where I study, I might say posh, right? Everybody is very Ooh. well behaved. They're well dressed. Yes. They're a little bit older, you know, and I'm kind of a young guy. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I don't know. I don't want to be, they're, they're older than me. I, you know, anyways, the point is, is that like, if I'm, if I'm younger, might as well play it up. You know, I got, I got something to prove. Might as well uh, lean into it. So I was very happy with the pose. They, they were some worse ones even they could have chosen. And uh, I think I think it's emblematic of who I am as a person, which is like, yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm, I'm a smart, smart enough guy to win a couple games in Jeopardy, but like still a goober at heart. I love it. Yeah. I love it all. Looking ahead to mm-hmm. the Tournament of Champions, poses aside, you know, we kind of identified maybe Final Jeopardy is an area, you know, here on the pod, we identified that maybe you're going to want to dive into because three for eight on those very critical final clues. When it's a runaway, lucky for you, you had some of those. It didn't matter, but certainly something you might want to take a look at for the TOC. Absolutely. Uh, I think that you guys are absolutely right. And if you have any more notes, by all means, like I'll take them. But uh, (laughs) Final Jeopardy is my weak spot. And something I knew was going to be my weak spot because there's a kind of grammar to Jeopardy. You know, there's a way the questions are written Mm -hmm. um, and especially a question like Final Jeopardy, which is a, a moment of protracted focus. You have to learn to approach them. Now, living in, a, in Europe, I mean, Jeopardy, I love you guys, but syndication hasn't quite made it out across the pond mm-hmm. yet. So no, sometimes it's no. difficult for me, to, for me mm-hmm. to tune in. Because you're studying at Oxford, for those who don't know. That's right. Yeah, I'm studying at Oxford, which helps me in some ways. But in terms of Final Jeopardy, <laughs> uh, did not. And I don't even think I got that. Makes James you Joyce very question. posh, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So absolutely. I think that uh, Final Jeopardy is something I'm going to take seriously for our Tournament of Champions. And Tournament of Champions is like, my project, you know, I'm really going to study. I think what I won, I was kind of joking around about it because like, you know, I just been working hard all day. I was ready to take a break. It was very short sighted, but I'm looking at the future. And I think tournament champions, pop music, musicals, things like that are, are, you know, I'm going to spend a solid five or six months just nailing down. And uh, maybe, maybe they'll, I'll start missing history questions. There you go. Well, I think what has to feel good for you is that you even had mentioned to me that, you know, you studied the month coming into when you were going to be playing and there were clues that came up that you knew because of your studying. So oh, it yeah. has to give you confidence that you can really make an impact on how prepared you will be coming into the TOC. Absolutely. I mean, like uh, Toby Keith, that was something I didn't know. The, the monitor sank off the coast of uh, Cape Hatteras. I didn't know that until I studied. One of my strengths, and it actually it has worked to my detriment at some time points in my life because it's made me so <laughs> lazy, but I have a great memory. Like my retention is really, really strong. So studying, I mean, a lot of people are like, how do you even begin? You know, I can just, I can read it once and I can retain it. So that's been very fortunate. Um, And I think that actually maybe that's kind of the downside of Final Jeopardy because it's like you spend so much time consuming the information that you don't, you know, figure out the kind of minutia or riddle-like quality of Final Jeopardy. So again, with some, with some recalculations, I really do plan to prep. And my, my initial run is kind of living proof that like prep does work. If you are fortunate enough like me to be in school full time, which means learning is your job. (laughs) Um, you know, I, I've got, I've got, I've got hours at the office to devote for Jeopardy. When does school start back up again for you? Yeah. So I'm going back to Oxford to finish my second year scholarship. I'm doing another master's and that happens in October. Now, you know, I, I've kind of been, uh, reading, reading the stars a little bit when uh, tournament champions might happen. I think it's going to be early in 2025. I don't know. That's what I'm predicting. So I've got all summer, no schoolwork distraction to begin to prep. And I actually just started today going through it. And then, you know, school, obviously I'll have to, you know, share custody of my time with that. Um, But, but again, (laughs) important, Yeah, very, very important. I mean, I do in my worst moments, I'm thinking, Oh, I already have one master's, you know, why do I need another? Let's just, let's just jeopardy, but no, 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 we got to get another one. But yeah, the studying will all take place during that period. All right. I'm looking ahead in my schedule. Can't confirm or deny anything about when we're taping TOC, but I do know 
August 16th, Inside Jeopardy is going to be in Detroit for a live event really? on Friday at SporkleCon. And I would love for you to come join us as a guest. Yeah, I'll be there. A hundred percent. All right. Yeah. I mean, this That'll is a live fun, moment. Right? You know, just like Jeff Probst. I didn't know this was coming. I'm happy to make it there. This was not rehearsed. I was just going to ask you, will you be in Oxford? Might you be in Michigan? Uh, yeah. What, we'll what do I, there. do I have to so, prepare? Maybe I got to study other stuff. No, okay. no, no. This is just going to be for fun. We will be playing an interactive game. You can join along, test okay. your skills. But really, we just want you to come on the podcast. And, you know, at that point, you can talk about how life has been as a seven game champion for a few months. I would be thrilled. I would be thrilled. That sounds like a great time. It's more Uncle Khan. I hear so much about it. So, you know, put me in your calendar. I love it. One of my favorite quotes that I read on Reddit after oh your run, which we talked about. Well, no, there was so much good. Was but like... one person said, you know, people wait their whole lifetimes to get on either of these shows. And he got on both in one year. <laughs> I saw that. I know. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny with you guys is that um, I had done the, the, the audition, online audition, when it first came up as an option years ago. You know, two maybe two years ago. It had been a while. And I remember yeah. my final audition was on Zoom and it was horrible timing because I had just, I had been studying abroad and I had been living in Belgium for my studies abroad. And I had to fly in that morning at four in the morning from, from somewhere else that I was living. And I had to move out of this apartment. I had to lug everything out. And at the end of the day, and you know, it was in Europe. So it was like eight or 9 PM. I had to do my final Jeopardy audition. You know, when I was I was buzzing in, but I was not the epitome of charm. And I thought to myself, oh, oh well, you know, I gave it a good run, <laughs> you know? And so then I, then I just assumed I was in the system. I wasn't getting picked. I had time to burn. And Survivor came up very suddenly in, a, in another avenue. And so I was doing that. And then you guys sent me a text message. I couldn't even believe it, you know? And I was like, I just have to alert you. Like, like obviously, I'm, I'm overjoyed, but I just did Survivor. And, you know, it's like, it's all, you know, we're going to see. Yep. And even then, I didn't really think it was going to happen. I was like, okay, well... You know, and then it did and he pulled through and I had about a month to prep, but it was such a shock. I really think that one of the advantages to like being young is that I don't really have like life experience about like. Here we go how, again with the young. Drew. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, it, for better or worse. It's a, it's a distinctive, uh, it's a distinctive part. Of I like it. As a player. I like but, it. But um, point is, I didn't, I didn't really have maybe the appreciation how difficult it is to do these things. So I just kind of threw myself at them. Um, and I think <laughs> I that's kind that. of a lesson for the, you know, the Redditors. You're like, uh, oh, it's my dream to do both. Have you been applying? You know, have you been, uh, you are taking the tests? Are you studying? Are you prepping? Because as I'm living proof, you know, I'm not an exceptional guy. They are very attainable dreams. I love this. Well, I think you are a pretty exceptional oh, guy, Drew. You. I'm very excited to see you in Detroit. I'm certainly excited to see you back for the TOC whenever that will be. Nah, and it's just better. been a joy to have you on the Alex Trebek stage. You're part of the Jeopardy family now, Drew. Welcome. It feels like a family. Everyone has been so kind. The alumni, you know, you guys over in production. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to see you in August at SporkleCon. It's been a pleasure. And that wraps up another episode of Inside Jeopardy. Join us next Monday as we cover another great week of games. And we'll see if Isaac can notch a fourth win. See you then.
Hey, thanks for watching. Click on the subscribe button and don't miss a moment.